welcome everybody for our October meeting of the IEEE. As usual, we you know we are the local chapter of the IEEE here uh, of the Comstock chapter in Portland. Um, we have a, a dozen active chapters in Portland, and Comstock is one of them, right? And and with that, um, I I'm going to hand over to Raf. Raf has been a, a long time, you know, IEEE, uh, you know, Oregon. A member, he's um, works for Intel uh, uh, Labs, and uh, he was actually a distinguished speaker uh, for us so, uh, way back in 2005 or uh, 2015, was it 16, sometime, sometime there, um, when he did one of our presentations at the Technologies Campus here uh, for a local presentation. So with that, I'm going to hand over uh, to Raf, who will uh, talk about the speaker and introduce the speaker. Thank you. Um, thank you, Pradeep. Um, uh, good afternoon, everybody. Um, it is, uh, I'm Rath Vanitambi again. Um, I'm uh, very happy to introduce uh, my friend, uh, Dr. Ekram Hussain, um, for this talk. Um, he's a professor and associate head of um, graduate studies in the Department of Electrical and Computer Engineering at the University of Manitoba, Canada. Um, he's a member of the College of the Royal Society of Canada and a fellow of the Canadian Academy of Engineering. And he's also an IEEE fellow. Uh, he has numerous um, awards, including a Distinguished Technical Achievement a Recognition Award, um, several research awards and um, a Communication Society Best Paper uh, Award. Uh, and many, many awards that he has won. And he has been um, uh, uh, ranked highly uh, cited researcher in computer science uh, in the last um, uh, many years, uh, uh, 2017, 18, and 19. And he uh, served as, as he's serving as a editor in chief of the IEEE Press and an editor for the IEEE transaction on uh, mobile computing. And he has previously served as an editor, uh, editor in chief for the um, IEEE communications uh, surveys and the tutorials, uh, which is the high impact um, journal. And uh, he's a distinguished lecturer uh, for the uh, IEEE, IEEE Communication Society and as well as uh, IEEE Vehicular Technology Society. And he's an elected member for the uh, Board of Governors of the IEEE Communication Society for the terms um, from uh, 2018 to 2020. Um, so um, let's, uh, you know, invite um, uh, um, um, Dr. Hussein to give a talk on um, computation offloading and activation of um, mobile edge computing servers. Let's welcome um, Dr. Hussein. Thank you. Uh, one more thing. I'm, so, I'm sorry. Um, uh, one more thing. Um, so. Um, uh, if the audience, you know, if you want to ask any questions uh, to Ikram, Ikram Hussain, um, you can uh, put uh, th those questions in the uh, Q&A. Uh, you can use the chat for, you know, uh, chatting uh, with others. But if you want to ask a question to uh, um, Ikram, you know, please put it in Q&A. Um, based on uh, the flow, you know, I can uh, bring some questions to um, uh, Ikram. Uh, the rest, uh, you know, uh, Ikram and um, I'll try to answer at the end of the talk. Uh, thank you. Okay. Uh, thank you, Rath, uh, for your uh, very generous introduction. And thank you, everyone. Uh, good evening. Uh, thank you for attending this uh, talk today. And I would like to thank uh, IEEE Comsoc Oregon chapter for organizing this virtual uh, distinguished, we call it distinguished lecture. Um, so as you, you see here already, uh, you see the slides here, uh, the title of the talk is Computation of Floating and Activation of Mobile Edge Computing Servers. So this talk is about edge computing. If you have come across this term, I'm not sure. This is something related to cloud computing, actually. It kind of originated from the concept of cloud computing, um, but more kind of uh, specific to mobile networks, uh, wireless 
networks. So what I will do, I will start off with kind of an introduction to uh, this cloud computing and edge computing and then mobile edge computing, what uh, you know, all this mean. Um, and then I will introduce two kind of uh, basic problems in mobile edge computing. Uh, one of these is computation of loading, which basically means uh, when and uh, how much maybe, you know, a mobile device should offload kind of uh, the computation tasks to a server, like to the cloud, the edge cloud. Um, this is like a basic problem because when uh, uh, you have this edge computing system, right? So the mobile devices would like to uh, have some of the computations done in the cloud, like an edge cloud instead of uh, doing those computations uh, in the devices themselves to save energy or get the computations faster. That's kind of the idea of edge computing. So, so this is a kind of a decision problem, right? So uh, whether a device should upload a job or should do it locally. So it, it depends on uh, many factors, like uh, for example, the load at the servers, you know, um, how many users are trying to offload. If it is very busy kind of, situation, a lot of users are trying to offload, maybe it's not a good idea. I mean, it would be delayed. So, so uh, a device has to make a decision wh whether to offload or not. And if it decides to offload, how much and things like that. And another uh, problem more from server's point of view is uh, whether the server should be on all the time. You know, I mean, they, they are power hungry devices. I mean, you want to or save energy in those servers, you know, uh, uh, you know, so that uh, they consume less power, etc. So, so activation of the servers is also something important. And as you can guess, uh, if you do not have many tasks, right, to be done, uh, to be computed, I mean, you don't need all the servers to be on, right? So, depending on the load, right, uh, I mean, uh, the servers may be able to activate or deactivate themselves. Deactivate means they can put themselves in the sleep mode, for example. So, uh, so, so, how to make a decision again uh, whether um, a server should be in the on on mode uh, or should go into the sleep mode? So, this is again a decision problem that arises in this kind of system. So, I will talk about this problem and and basically uh, both of these problems uh, we can model using some very simple game model. If you know this game theory is like a mathematical kind of tool that uh, can be used to model situations where uh, you know the agents or you know entities they compete with each other or they want to cooperate with each other. So uh, they can model competition and cooperation among uh, among agents, simply speaking. So. Uh, in this case, uh, we will use a simple game model called minority game model for both these, of these problems. So I'll just give you kind of a flavor, you know, like uh, how these problems uh, can be modeled and, and uh, in a way that uh, is implementation friendly, you know, in a simple way, in a distributed way, uh, but uh, enhancements can be done. I mean, you can make these models more uh, sophisticated by bringing a lot of other parameters. So that kind of a research issue that remains and, and there are a lot of opportunities for innovation actually. So uh, yeah, so and then I will uh, go a little bit of detail on those models and show you some uh, results, uh, basic performance kind of results. And uh, hopefully we'll have time to talk about some of the um, research reactions uh, uh, in, this, in this context. So. Anyway, so uh, we are all familiar with this cloud computing concept. We have been using it all the time, right? Dropbox, you know, uh, OneDrive. These are like a cloud service actually uh, we use for storage. And also, uh, you know, we have uh, applications which use uh, these clouds like the data centers, right? Uh, so, so it's basically um, cloud computing is basically, uh, I mean, uh, some computing services that we, we, we uh, use through the internet, right? And those computing is done in the cloud. I mean, the big data centers with thousands of servers, hundreds of thousands of servers. Uh, so the computing resources, they reside in the cloud and, and users use them as, uh, as 
needed. So that's the idea of the cloud computing. Um, now, the idea of edge computing is to, uh, is to bring these computing resources closer to the users, like near the network edge. Uh, so, so uh, of course, this is not a replacement for the, uh, for the cloud, but it's more like a, to complement the cloud computing uh, facilities so that uh, as you can probably guess to uh, to uh, reduce the latency for example and when a user wants to access a cloud server if it could be like a, you know a very in the deep in the network somewhere you know it, i mean uh, uh, i mean there could be a lot of delays etc internet delays and things like that but if you can put the computing resources closer to the users in the access, access network, for example, then uh, presumably, you know, it will be much faster to access uh, those services, right? So, so you put the uh, servers closer to the user, users and basically near uh, the network edge or near the access network. So that's the idea of edge computing. And now when you uh, use this edge computing uh, in the context of mobile users, right? Mobile networks, so or you, you call it mobile edge computing. So basically those servers could be uh, in the uh, wireless network infrastructure close to the users. And actually a part, they could be part of the radio access network actually. And that's how things are evolving in, in 5G and beyond 5G systems. Uh, computing would be very much integrated with communication. So those uh, 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 server facilities uh, will, uh, uh, will reside in the infrastructure, in the, in the mobile network infrastructure. Um, and, and basically uh, we'll have uh, these computing servers kind of part of the RAN you can think of, uh, part of the radio access network. So as you can see in this, uh, in this figure here, I'm basically the, the devices can uh, offload uh, their uh, tasks some very computation intensive tasks would be, you know, uh, I mean, some math lab kind of, you know, I mean, very complicated, maybe very computation intensive uh, job, right? Those, uh, I mean, uh, they may take huge amount of time if they execute them, those jobs uh, within the devices, but it might be faster if they can offload to some uh, servers where the uh, computing, I mean, uh, facilities or like computation capabilities are much better. Uh, and then, of course, those uh, results have to be sent back to the users, right? So, so that's uh, the idea of like uh, uh, edge computing uh, in, in a mobile system. So the users offload the task, the task uh, is computed, and then the results will come back to the user. Uh, so as I just said, uh, said uh, users uh, may have computationally intensive tasks, uh, you know, um, image processing, you know, maybe some uh, you know, like machine learning kind of uh, applications, uh, which may involve a lot of uh, computations, uh, augmented reality applications. And generally the mobile devices have limited computation capability and limited battery capacity. So energy is kind of concern here. So they may like to transfer this expensive task to remote server where, um, you know, uh, they have like higher computational capability. Um, so in this way, they basically save energy, right? Uh, that would be that would have been spent if they would uh, be doing this locally, right? So, and they save battery power and extend the life. So there are motivations of uh, uh, doing this uh, to do this completion of loading, and more importantly, um, to get the job done faster. I mean, that kind of the uh, kind of more important. Uh, so. I mean, uh, if there are no, no edge computing servers, well, they could send it to the cloud servers, you know, in, in data centers. Uh, but uh, those servers are outside the access network. Like, as I said, some, you know, some IXPs or in other, you know, Amazon, Google servers. So there could be long communication delays, right? And also, of course, the internet resources will be, uh, will be spent. Um, and of course, if it's a very dense wireless network, right? I mean, sending all these uh, tasks to the servers uh, will have a lot of cost uh, in terms of the backhaul cost, right? I mean, you know, the backhaul traffic, which basically connects uh, uh, backhaul uh, infrastructure, which connects these wireless systems to the internet, right? There'll be a lot of, uh, I mean, uh, 
traffic there. So, so I mean, that will also, also contribute to the delay. But if they offload these tasks to the ad servers, which could be co-located with the base stations, for example, uh, you know, um, uh, I mean, in the infrastructure or maybe in the, in the, in the mobile, mobile infrastructure, then, I mean, uh, the, the backhauling cost could be reduced. So this could be a better alternative from that point of view as well. So anyway, so uh, the idea is uh, the users will experience probably uh, lower latency if, uh, you know, if uh, they can upload their task to the edge computing servers. So um, now, uh, as I was mentioning at the beginning, uh, this is uh, a resource allocation problem actually, uh, in the sense that uh, when a device wants to offload the job, of course the communication resources will need to be allocated, right? To, to send, the, send the job, right? Send those data, whatever. Uh, and then uh, also the resources in the servers need to be allocated actually. So, uh, so you have got now resource allocation uh, for the communication resources as well as for the computing resources. So, so it's, it's like a resource allocation problem, uh, you know, involved here in, in the offloading um, uh, process. Uh, and if you think of a like a non-cooperative kind of scenario, like each device uh, makes a decision by itself. Uh, so, I mean, uh, without any kind of coordination, for example, so it's more like a distributed kind of a decision-making problem. So each user will try to uh, use those servers uh, in order to maximize its own utility, right? Uh, so there will be kind of a competition, right? Among the, among the uh, users. Uh, so we are talking about a scenario where they do not talk to each other. There is no like a central controller, right? I mean, every device makes a decision by itself uh, whether to offload or whether to do it locally, right? Um, so so uh, this is, as I, say, as I mentioned, this is more like a distributed kind of decision-making problem. Um, and this is probably better than a centralized kind of uh, system where say some control entity collects information from the all users and depending on their requirements, uh, may make a decision on who is going to offload, whose, whose job is going to be offloaded and which server will be allocated. So this will be a more like a centralized kind of system. But, you know, I mean, uh, for any system which is kind of uh, uh, centralized, like uh, there's a single point of failure and also there are or scalability issues, right? So, so uh, if you think of a very you know dense kind of a system, a lot of users, uh, you'd like to have a more distributed and self-organizing kind of solution with minimal uh, kind of information exchange, you know, a kind of minimal control. So, so, so uh, solutions which are distributed, self-organizing, and uh, kind of efficient in the sense that they don't. Uh, involve a lot of signaling, et cetera, right? Those are preferable. Uh, <clears throat> so, so this is what we aim to do actually. So this computation offloading problem, we want to solve it in a distributed way, in a self-organizing way, uh, without involving a lot of signaling exchanges. Um, so now the other problem as I was also mentioning at the beginning, the activation of the edge computing servers, um, of course, you know, utilization of those servers is very uh, important. Uh, if there are not many jobs, there's no point in, uh, you know, turning all these servers on, right? I mean, uh, wasting of, uh, this will be a wastage of uh, energy power, right? Um, so, but of course, if you have more jobs, uh, you, you may need to uh, use more servers. So this is again, like a dynamic kind of a, uh, it gives us to a dynamic, um, scenario where, you know, depending on the you know, arrival of the task, you may need to uh, dynamically turn and on and off those servers to save energy and use them efficiently, right? Uh, yeah, so if you think, uh, I mean, from both the users and the server's viewpoint, maybe the users will want more servers to be turned on so that, uh, you know, they can get their job done quicker, right? Faster. 
but on the other hand, if you look at the server's um, point of view, if there are not many jobs, I mean, you know, I mean, most of the time they'll be idle. And I mean, if you think of like uh, generating revenue, for example, like say for, for, for each job done, a server gets some revenue. I mean, it may not be worth, right? If there are not many jobs, each server gets only hand, you know, a few jobs and it may not be worth, uh, you know, for the server. So there's a kind of a, you know, like a, uh, a trade-off here. Uh, so a solution that meets both the user's requirements and also the server's, uh, you know, requirement. I mean, make both the parties happy would be nice, right? So, so, uh, so we'll talk about the kind of a method to do that. Um, basically, we will, uh, uh, you know, uh, solve this problem, like try to solve this problem of activation of mobile edge computing servers so that both the servers are happy as well as the users are also happy. So the user's latency requirements are met. Also, the uh, servers can generate, you know, enough revenue that make them happy. So that kind of the idea here. Uh, well, so so the the um, methods that we are going to develop actually uh, are based on this uh, what is called minority game model. Very simple. So this minority game uh, basically originated uh, from what is called this Alferol bar problem. Uh, so the problem is like this. So uh, there's a bar inside the campus, in, you know, in, in, a, in a college. So, and the students uh, want to, you know, uh, like to attend the bar once every week or maybe every day. Now, uh, every student enjoys the bar only if the attendance is 60% or less. So for example, you say, okay, that's for simplicity, say there are three students, right? So, uh, I mean, all of, three, all of three, three of them can attend the bar or maybe one or two of them. Now, if, if all of them attend, maybe it's too crowded. Just uh, you see like a toy example. So they don't enjoy, right? But say if only one guy goes there and it's kind of, you know, quiet and, and he, he enjoys. So, so uh, minority kind of wins. So among the agents, the, uh, those who are kind of in the minority, they are kind of winner. So that's, that's the idea of this minority game. So, now the students have to make a decision what they should do. Now each student knows, well, if it is too, uh, if it is too much crowded, I mean, this will be, uh, be a waste of my time, right? On the other hand, if there are not too many people going there, I will enjoy, and so it will be worth going there. So now how does a student make a decision, right? So same thing, like in the context of this offloading, like a device uh, may want to offload you know, if it predicts that there are not too many users of loading, so you will get its job done faster, right? But on the other hand, if it make a bad, if it makes a bad prediction, like uh, it offloads while many other people are trying to offload, maybe you know it it won't be worth for him. It will be even more delayed than uh, you know if it had done it locally. So kind of a similar uh, problem here. So anyway, so I will uh, go through the basics of this minority game. So the original game was proposed for an odd number of players. We, we call them players. So in a game, the agents, like who, who basically participate in this decision-making process, right? We call them players. And each player has uh, two alternative actions. So for example, in this uh, alpha roll bar problem, so uh, two actions possible, right? One is to go to the bar, other is to stay home, right? And players selecting the minority option receives a payoff, okay? And remember, there is no communication among the players, everybody by herself. So, you know, there is no communication or there is no kind of a cooperation among the players. Um, so, so this is, uh, if you are familiar uh, uh, with this congestion game, this is kind of a congestion game. And a congestion game is actually um, a game where uh, multiple agents, they, they, they basically compete with each other to share some resources, you know, some common resources. And each player wants to maximize its own payoff. Uh, and, and also, um, 
In this case, players are bounded relational. Like this is a terminology that's used in game theory when uh, a player does not have the complete information. Of course, he doesn't know what other people are thinking, right? So this is a situation where uh, the agents are boundedly rational because they do not have the complete information. So they kind of try to guess, right? They kind of uh, try to predict. So this is what is called inductive reasoning uh, in contrast to what we call deductive reasoning, right? So it's more like a making a guess prediction. So, so same thing here, each player has to make a kind of a inductive reasoning. I, I mean, uh, learn maybe from its previous experiences, right? So that it can make a good decision, right? Okay, so now this idea actually, I mean, we use in our everyday life. I mean, uh, for example, we try to select, you know, uh, roads which are less crowded, you know, we go to restaurants which are probably not too busy, right? Uh, well, uh, market traders, they decide to join the market when there are not too many competitors, right? So you see the minority, we, we prefer to be in the minority somehow. Uh, so even in like in wireless communications, I mean, there are examples where, you know, similar situation arises. Like for example, this uh, Aloha based channel access, right? I mean, if too many users, you know, try to access the channel, I mean, everybody loses contention due to contention, right? Uh, so maybe, you know, the guys, I mean, the minority, they are, they have better uh, payoff maybe, right? If there are too many users are trying to transmit, the guys who are not transmitting, maybe they're better off, right? Uh, if uh, on the fuses transmit, the other guys are not transmitting, those guys transmitting could be better off. So, you know, the minority kind of uh, wins. And also a uh, similar thing in, in cognitive radio network. I mean, same thing like a channel access, too many users trying to transmit, then they cause a lot of interference to the primary uh, transmit I mean, receivers in a, in a cognitive radio system. So those guys are uh, losing, maybe those guys uh, not transmitting it would be the winner. Um, also like in a, in a, in a D2D uh, communication, like mode selection, maybe if there are too many users trying to use D2D mode, there will be more you know, interference, contention, uh, right? So, so uh, we, all, we have a similar situation uh, like a minority game. Okay, so uh, let's. Um, uh, Akram, uh, is that okay to interrupt? And of course, of course, because of course. you are keep talking, and you know you wanted to hear some noise as well, right? Yeah, yeah of course. Yes, yes, yes. Okay. Um, uh, one thing is like you know, um, um, so um, the, 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 there are like you know private edges as well as the um, uh, public edges. So you know what do you what do you uh, what is your uh, take on you know um, like a private versus public, and also you know the problem that you are defining, um, is it going to be the same uh, in in private and uh, public as well? You mean private? What do you mean like a private? Uh, um, uh, it, it's How do it's. You mean? Um, yeah, you know, uh, in the sense, you know, uh, like, you know, uh, the private networks and things are coming along, right? So they ha might have their own uh, edge uh, uh, yeah, yeah, in, yeah, in yeah. there, right? Yeah, right. I got your point. So I think this is all uh, like, how do you want to design your system? If you want to have more a centralized control, of course, I mean, everything is dictated by a controller, you know? like whose job is going to be offloaded and which server will be allocated. But if you want to have a more distributed system, even in a private cloud, I mean, you, 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 you leave it for the devices to decide maybe. So it's a more distributed kind of a control. So of course, I mean, I, uh, centralized control will give you better performance for sure, because you can control, you can optimally kind of decide, right. but on the other hand, it's more uh, overhead, more complicated in the sense of collecting information from these users and solving this optimization. And, you know, I mean, then making a decision and sending the decisions back, right? So this is like a generic, I mean, you know, trade-off that we see uh, bit, I mean, when we talk, when we compare a centralized control and a distributed control system. I see. Um, and the other thing is like, um, 
from the user point of view, yes, minority, you know, better, uh, you know, gain better. But uh, from the um, um, service provider point of view, uh, they want more, you know, loads to come to the server, right? Uh, yes. Exactly, so yeah. are you going to address that? Yeah, yeah exactly. So, okay, so okay. the second problem that I said, so we okay, want to okay, yeah, make okay. both so, guys happy. You have exactly. to make both the users as well as the server safety, right? So I see, I see. Yeah, so that more and more uh, complete kind of. Uh, okay, all right. One other thing is like you know there is the uncertainty, uncertainty at the devices. Like it, it does not know whether it's crowded, the rest, the bar is crowded or not, right? But the yeah. thing is, you know, um, uh, in this, uh, like you know, there can be some protocols, you know, between the device and the uh, the cloud to get the, you know, what is the loading condition, and then, exactly. you know. Uh, that is yeah, another yeah. way of to look at, you know, yeah, just yeah. wanted to so, get your... So, so, so we are talking about a very simple system without any extra side information. Okay. Only okay. one All bit right. of information I will see. Okay. But of course, if you have more side information, if you learn, if you talk to other guys and try to predict their intention, of course, you can do better. Okay, okay. All right. Thank yeah. you. So, but here we, try, we are trying to be very simple, you know. I don't talk to anybody. I am just by myself. I do, I mean like a almost dumb kind of I'm you know not you know not doing too much of learning that kind of situation. Of course, with more side information, I mean you can do better. Okay. It's more like a taking an action strategically, right? So right. the better strategy you have, of course, you can do better, right? So and if you have more information, you should be able to make your strategies better. Yeah. Thank you. Yes, thank you. No, good question. Very good questions. Okay, so uh, let's, uh, uh, oops, I'm going up, sorry. So let's uh, talk, I mean, very, you know, <clears throat> high level again in this minority game. So um, we have say N players and you get to define a cutoff value. Let's say for example, for our three student case. So say we define the cutoff to be one, that means if one guy stays home and two guys go to the bar, the guy staying home is basically winner. Because two guys, I mean, they are kind of, they don't enjoy because it's too much crowded. Or uh, other way, if one guy goes to the bar and two guys stays home, the guy went to, going to the bar is the winner. So, so basically the, the cutoff uh, kind of decides or determines which is the winning action, right? So when they originally proposed, they took it to be like n minus one by two. So if it is uh, seven players, they choose to be three, but it doesn't need to be three. I mean, it could be five as well. Okay, so, uh, so it doesn't need to be really just n minus one by two. It can be any, any value. The, you know, it depends on our system, how we want to define the minority cutoff, right? And another definition here uh, called the attendance. Now, because it's a basic minority game, you've got two actions and you denote them by one and zero. For example, going to the bar, you call it action, uh, denote by one and staying home, you say zero. So um, attendance, some of the actions of the players, you call this attendance, it's just a terminology. Um, well, as I said, a player selecting minority action will have a higher utility. So for simplicity, say we define the utility like this. Say for action one, say the guy going to the bar will have a positive utility if uh, NT, basically number of people in the bar is less than or equal to that cutoff threshold, right? Uh, and the utility is zero if the bar is crowded, if it is greater than, if number of people there is greater than the cutoff threshold. Okay, so the people who are staying home, a uh, guy is staying home, he gets a positive utility if the bar is crowded, right? If there are too many people, he gets a zero utility if the bar is not crowded. Right, so so that's how we can define the utility. As I said, it doesn't need to be one one. I mean, it could be anything, but just for simplicity, say we, we take it to be one. So uh, now, the only information that each player has is the outcome of the game at the end of the day. At end of the each stage of the game, each player knows which action was the winning action. So that's the only information that it gets from the system, right? And then. Basically, it can save this information and look back and see the historical information. And from there, it, it tries to make a good prediction on the 
future action. So that's the idea. So it's more like a machine learning kind of thing. So based on the your previous data, right? I mean, previous experiences, you try to make a good prediction on your uh, next action, which, what, which would be the best thing to do in the next stage of the game. Okay, so here is a, like a simple example, uh, five players and minority threshold two. I think uh, like, for example, if all these five guys go to the bar, the total utility will be zero. They are like, a, 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 like a, you know, uh, attendance is five. So the utility is zero. So if say, for example, three guys go to the bar and, and two guys stay home, so the guys staying home because it's zero here. So basically there is nobody. If it's one here, then the utility will be one. Three guys go to the bar, two guys stay home. So the guys staying home are the winner. So they get utility of two. Uh, two guys go to the bar, three guys stay home. The guys going to the bar are the winners. So you have total utility too. So basically some of the utilities of all the users. So what we observe here, uh, when the attendance is equal to the cutoff value, the total utility, utility is maximized. So basically what it tells us, the system will operate uh, you know, efficiently if the attendance is kind of close to the cutoff value, right? So then the system will be efficiently operating, right? So, so because the total utility is maximized when your attendance is same as the cutoff value. Another example, say we've got six players and your threshold is four. So, so now, uh, say say four players go to the bar and two guys uh, two two students they stay home so the guys going to the bar are the winner because we have defined the threshold to be four now so it's four here so again the same thing uh, you you see if your attendance is equal to the cutoff value the total utility is maximized right so so if, if you want to operate the system efficiently uh, you know uh, we sh should make our algorithm right such that uh, each user uses the algorithm and the total attendance in the system remains close to the cutoff value. That will be the good, you know, um, the good system, you know, so the system will operate efficiently. Uh, okay, so now, uh, now, how should a player then play? I mean, how should a player uh, make a decision? As I said, uh, the only information a player has is the outcome of the previous stages of the game. Right, so it has some historical information. So its idea is very simple. So um, say you have got you have got information of the previous two stages of the game. Now you can have uh, four four possibilities, right? So yesterday, uh, like a Tuesday and Monday, well, the winning actions were staying home. So you know, zero means staying home, and one means going to the bar, right? So. So if you look at uh, history of the last two days, right? So you can have these four possibilities, right? Uh, so, uh, so now what do you do? You basically uh, choose a strategy. This is your strategy table, for example. This is an example strategy table. So what, you, what it says, okay, so if the last two days, the guys staying home or the winners, maybe I should go tomorrow, I mean, today, you know, say today. Last two days, the guys staying home were the winners. So today, maybe it's, it's better for me to go. So that's what it says, right? Uh, if, you know, um, on, on uh, today's or Wednesday. So Tuesday, the guys uh, going to the bar were the winner, but Monday, the guys staying home were the, uh, were the winner. Maybe uh, today I should go. So. So this is like a strategy table. Now, of course, I mean, uh, this is just one choice, but you can have like a, a 16 different choices here, right? Because you've got uh, four, so two to the four, like a 16 different choices. So uh, 16 possible strategies are, are possible here. So uh, as, you, as you increase your history string, if you go back further, right, you'll have a lot more strategies that uh, you can uh, you know, choose from. So for example, if you have got a history of last three days, right? Then you have got eight different um, combinations. So it's two to the power eight, it's like 256 possible strategies. So an agent, right? A, a player will uh, follow a strategy, uh, you know, to make its decision on the next action. 
but as you can see, if you have a long history, there are too many possibilities. I mean, so what do you do? I mean, uh, for practical reason, maybe, you know, you don't uh, want to use all the strategies. Uh, I mean, you know, you choose a few of them and then uh, you make your decision based on these few uh, presumably good strategies that, uh, you know, you want to use. So, uh, so people what uh, have done, like they use the, what they call the reduced strategy spaces. So you don't take all of these 16 strategies, choose a few of them. And, and the idea is to score those strategies based on the outcome, right? So basically uh, you will score uh, each strategy after uh, the game is played. And when you need to make a decision, you follow the strategy that has the highest score so far. It's a very common sense kind of a idea, okay? So just for simplicity, you know, you don't want to uh, maybe use the universal, the entire strategy space. You choose a few of them and you try to score them. You score them as the game proceeds. And the next time when you want to make a decision, so you look at the strategy which has the highest score. This is like a, they call it simple uh, kind of aligning, you know, uh, method that you can use. Uh, now, as I... Uh, already mentioned, to measure the system performance, you look at the attendance in the system, right? And if the attendance is around the cutoff value, as you, as you have seen, uh, the performance is good because the total utility is kind of high, right? So uh, smaller volatility. So the, the difference between the attendance and the cutoff, they call it volatility. So the smaller the volatility, uh, the better it is. Uh, so, you know, the total utility of the system is better. So, so basically when you try to measure the performance of the system, we will look at the volatility, right? You know, so uh, how is the attendance uh, varying, you know, um, and how far it is from the cutoff value, you know, as, as the game proceeds. So it's like a repeated game, right? So it's, it's a played, like a, if you, in a wireless system, for example, like in every slot or every, you know, a competition of floating interval, right? So you see on average, right, how, how, uh, how the attendance is varying while each player is playing this distributed game, right? Okay, so uh, yeah, I think that's why I already mentioned. So uh, each player will choose a few strategies among uh, the universal strategy space and um, players will evaluate their strategies, score their strategies as the game is played. And, um, and uh, strategies which uh, perform better, they will be given points, okay, for predicting, you know, uh, accurately and poorly performing strategies uh, will not get any credit. So, you know, so they won't be chosen, you know, while a, student, a player makes a decision next time. Very simple idea. Okay, so now, uh, I think uh, you got probably a high level idea of this minority game. Now, it's kind of uh, useful uh, in the context of uh, wireless, uh, many wireless problems, uh, because uh, it, it, you know, these kind of models can accommodate large number of agents. Um, and you know, each agent can uh, make a decision independently in a self-organizing manner. And there is not much external uh, you know, information or signaling exchanges involved here. And also users can be anonymous. So it's kind of maybe good, you know, because a player doesn't need to ex expose his identity, right? So there is no pairwise interactions among the agents. Uh, so now we uh, use this model for a very simple scenario uh, of uh, computation of floating. Say you've got N users, homogeneous users, um, mobile devices and each device has computation capability, uh, you know, uh, denoted by CU is like a CPU speed, for example, right? 10 megahertz, you know, um, and uh, all users have tasks that they want to offload to a server. We consider one server just uh, for simplicity here. So uh, objective is to maximize uh, users utility in terms of the uh, latency minimization. So a task, uh, a user wants the task to be computed quickly, right? So the, you know, uh, the sooner the better. 
so uh, each computation of loading period is like one round of the game is like one stage of the game and the players at the mobile devices right the users so again uh, the two options of load or you compute it locally right uh, now we don't talk about the service uh, you know many different service policies of the servers let's assume that they are serving round robin manner in the servers right if job comes it's, it's uh, i mean you know the servers can serve them uh, in a fair way. Okay, so so now how do we put this in a in a in a minority uh, game model? Uh, so what we need, we need to find out that threshold, right? Cut off threshold. As I mentioned, that threshold determines the winning action actually, uh, and also the payoff of the players. So in this case, how do we define the cut off threshold? So it's very simple. Say Say if your your n users at a certain point in time they are uh, offloading to the uh, server and uh, l is the latency experienced by user, right? When there are n simultaneous you know uh, users uh, offloaded to the uh, server, and cb is the computation speed of the server, for example, and cu is the computation speed at the user device. Now, if your job, if your task uh, requires n CPU cycles, for example, so to compute this job uh, locally, you will need like m over CU, that much of time you need, right? And to do the job at the server side, it will require m over CB. It's like a CPU speed, for example. So. When you have n users in the server, if you think of worst case, say you are the last guy, so the total amount of time that uh, you know you will need to get your job done is like n times um, what m divided by cb, right? As long as that is smaller than the time that you need when you do it locally, then you basically gain something, right? So then it's what for you to offload. And just this idea, uh, using this idea, you can uh, basically obtain this value of the uh, cutoff. So, so as I just said, uh, if your uh, job is done locally, you need this much of time, right? Um, and if you do it in the server, this is the amount of time that you need. In the worst case, you know, say you're the last guy, you know, uh, and uh, including yourself, there are uh, like n total jobs there, right? So, so, so as long as the number of users uh, of, load, of loading, right, to the server is less than this or equal to this, then you, you, you get your job done quicker than, you know, you would be when uh, compared to when you'll be doing locally, right? So this can serve as your uh, uh, cutoff value. Now, remember the users have no idea about this, you know, so, but here for the system, if you want to evaluate the system, we need this phi because uh, we need to calculate the payoff of the users, right? But the users don't need to, uh, I mean, they, do, they don't have any, may not have any clue about this phi. As Rat was saying, maybe they can make you know, some estimates or they can talk to other friends in, to get an idea about phi that may enable them to make a, uh, you know, better decision, but in this basic model, the only thing they have is the feedback at the end of the each stage of the game, which one was the winning action, that's it. So that's what I, I wrote here, because this is important um, parameter here, right? Because this cutoff um, determines the outcome of the game and the payoffs of the players, right? And the players only know the outcome of the game, right? I mean, which one is the Winning, winning action. That's what. That's only they have now at this point. Okay, so Ikram, uh, Ikram, I'm sorry yeah. to interrupt again. Yeah, uh, so yeah. basically, you know, a couple of things here. You know, one thing is I think you uh, assume you know all the workloads are the same size or something. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's and similar. and also like you know there is a overhead involved in you know sending the uh, load to the uh, edge and uh, get it back and also you kind of you know ignore those things at this point i guess yeah yeah so so you see that the the 
total delay would be like the transmission delay right, right. computation delay and then sending it back Correct. so that are two 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 delays in fact um, those are considered but here i do not you know that's yeah, for yeah. simplicity okay. but remember so in reality uh, i mean the total latency would include those two delays transmission and then you know the on the reverse link and the forward link as well that is another factor like the devices wouldn't have enough clue of you know how much of latency you know transmission latency and things are going to take uh, yeah yeah well i mean uh, now again if they can learn about the channel interference yeah you know, it's possible can, yeah right yeah yeah so okay. you see that's why i said you can do a lot of learning here you know so uh, but just uh, here i mean i ignored them assuming that okay Uh, those are probably smaller compared to your computation you know okay probably the computation is the most significant component in the latency maybe you know yeah okay good question yeah okay so yeah so now i think we we got the model already um, uh, so uh, so if minority of floats and majority computes locally then minority wins right if minority computes locally and majority of floats uh again minority wins majority loses because uh if many people are float i mean more than 5 then basically the latency will be higher than uh if they would have done it locally so that those guys are losers so the control information is only this you can think of this one bit information here i mean the outcome of the game right at the end of the game so that's only the users have so you see this information goes in the history right uh and then uh then that enables the users to uh basically uh, i mean that affects the user selection of the strategy right so they are just looking at this feedback and accordingly they are trying to choose a good strategy okay so um now again it's very similar to the the the, the you know the bar problem that we said the way we define the utility so for a offloading user it gets a positive utility if uh, the server is not too much crowded right if the number of offloading uh, uh, users less than this threshold otherwise the server is crowded they they, they are lose it they get zero utility uh, uh, device computing locally uh, will be loser uh, if the server is not crowded right so there are fewer uh, tasks than this threshold but a local guy will be winner if the server is busy right so this he gets a better latency uh, while doing it locally instead of up of loading to the server okay so uh, so we this definition of the utility now we can simulate the system right we can simulate the system uh, and see how it works and the learning method uh, the algorithm is very simple they call it basic strategy reinforcement technique so basically you choose a few strategies and as you play you score those strategies and next time you choose the strategy with the highest score you know and uh, when do you score a strategy if the prediction from that strategy proves to be the right one right so uh, say today you are uh, you are deciding to go into the bar and and that comes from your strategy table right the table says well last two days uh, the winning action was staying home uh, uh, today you better go so you choose that strategy and you saw okay you are the winner so that strategy you score it you 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 give it score right so you give it point so very simple idea uh okay so as i said so they call it like a, a basic strategy reinforcement technique uh, yeah so uh, each user initially uh, randomly chooses a few strategy those are like tables right um and then uh, when you start so we can select any strategy among those at random uh, initially the scores are all zero of those uh, strategies and uh you choose a strategy randomly and you uh, take an action predicted by that strategy and everybody does the same right and then you get at the end of the game you get the result right the winning action right for that stage of the game and then you basically score if uh, uh if 
the prediction matches with one of those strategies, you basically give that strategy a score, incre increase the score. Otherwise, uh, you know, uh, the other strategies on 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 get any score. Okay. Um, well, I mean, you can do uh, variations here. You know, uh, the, the, this is a, a basic uh, learning, but you can do uh, like a, they call it exponential learning or other simple strategies uh, like um, uh, win, stay, lose, deviate. So, for example, if yesterday you you uh, your action was the winning action, today you take the same action, uh, but if uh, uh, you know, if yesterday your action yesterday was a losing action, then today you deviate. So there are a lot of like simple ideas, you know, uh, win, stay, lose, deviate, uh, you know, like, uh, or use this kind of uh, learning or exponential learning. So basically you, uh, this update, updating of the weights is done in a different way. Instead of just, you know, increasing it by one, you, you, do it, you can do it in different way. So a uh, lot of variations possible. So anyway, so I, I show you like a simple result, like with this uh, uh, learning, very simple learning. I mean, you can do better than a, a random kind of a uh, method. Uh, so this basically shows the evolution of the system as, as time goes. So basically the attendance kind of, uh, as long as, as I said, if it remains close to the cutoff value, then your system is doing well. Okay, so if it does not fall much below, then it's not very good. So on average, if your attendance is close to the cutoff, your system is working properly. Now here, uh, basically it shows the average utility, the user uh, over time. So this red one is the random. If you just randomly, you know, decide whether to offload or you know not to offload, but uh, it seems to be better to use this uh, uh, learning, you know, compared to the random selection. Of course, this is the optimal one. So the uh, minority one is of course suboptimal because you don't make the best decision all the time, right? So it's suboptimal, but just to give you a kind of an idea, it, it should uh, work better than random. Um, Ekram, you know, yeah, yeah. So, yeah. you know uh, the, the, the minority game based, you know, the suboptimal one is, you know, pretty far from uh, the optimal one, right? You know, and it's a lot more closer to the, uh, the random than uh, the optimal one. So, um, yeah, so, so I think a yes. lot more room to improve. Yeah, yeah, of course. So, so basically here, this probably, uh, I mean, you can do probably something here, you know, so the uh, way you scored the uh, strategies or here you see one major limitation here. Uh, you don't really uh, adapt your strategies, right? It's the same strategies, you're just scoring them. Maybe you should uh, move to another set of strategies, you know, instead of sticking to a fixed set of strategies, maybe, you know, you, you choose subsets of uh, different strategies, you know, uh, you update your strategies, uh, you know, uh, as you learn from the game. So. You understand Rath, what I'm trying to say? You 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 are stick to four strategies and you're trying right. to always you know choose one among four, right? Scoring them. Maybe it's good to enhance your strategy set. Mm -hmm. You include more strategies and get rid of some of the old ones. So you can make it more dynamic, maybe your uh, strategy selection, right? So that probably uh, will do better. As I said, this is kind of very basic. Okay. Um, so the more intelligent way you can do, the better it is. And maybe you have more side information, you can make a better decision. Like uh, even in uh, things like uh, queue learning, you know, or maybe, you know, those- I Other mean, techniques could be used, yeah. Kind of, yeah, similar, but not exactly. Uh, you see, I mean, I think this is a very important thing. I mean, the way you are scoring, maybe it's, uh, you should to do more conservatively maybe, or maybe more aggressively, you know? So instead of doing like this, maybe you increment only by, you know, like in Q learning, for example, they use a Bellman equation and things like that. So which is probably, I mean, maybe better. Okay. Yeah, so yeah, this is, uh, I mean, for sure. I mean, there are scores for, uh, improvement, uh, you know, so if you can make a more intelligent uh, learning algorithm, it should probably work better, yeah. 
Okay, so I, so I think you, you got kind of the idea of this offloading uh, um, problem and how do you model it as a minority game and, and how agents can learn distributedly, right? So, um, so I mean, as we just mentioned, uh, I mean, if your algorithm is more intelligent, uh, you should be able to get closer to probably the optimal where you always, you know, your system always attendance is the same as the cutoff all the time. So it's always optimal. Okay, so now uh, the max, um, uh, max server activation, as I said, we want to make both the users and the servers happy. Uh, so, so now from, as I already mentioned before, from server's point of view, each server wants to have more jobs. As I said, think of, think like this, for each job, it gets some money, right? It gets some, uh, you know, something. So the more job it can do, maybe it's, uh, it's more worth for it to be remain uh, to remain active. So, uh, so say at, at a certain offloading interval, you have got catty uh, jobs, right? Uh, now, now, well, I mean, uh, of course, each. Uh, I mean, this is just for modeling, remember? So say, let's say, okay, at a, at a certain uh, now floating interval, you have got catty uh, jobs. Now, um, now, as I said, a server wants to have more jobs. If you have got say, and uh, let's go to the next slide, Oops, sorry. Uh, say each server wants to have at least these many jobs to earn a threshold revenue. So it's not what for the server if it does not have at least these many jobs, right? So which means uh, the maximum number of servers that should be active is KT over k -min. So these many jobs you have, these many jobs you have at certain, you know, uh, offloading interval and each server wants to have at least k -min jobs. So if you have more than these many servers active, each server will get fewer than these many jobs, so and it's not happy, right? So, so for a server, it's beneficial to be active if your uh, if the number of active servers is less than this, right? If there are more servers than this, then each server gets fewer jobs. It's not happy. And as I said, from user's perspective, the more the servers. Uh, the more servers are active, the better, uh, you know, uh, for them because they can get their jobs done faster. So say each user, uh, like user, each user wants, uh, for example, uh, at most KMX jobs per server, at most. So each server should not have more than KMX jobs. Uh, that means uh, with this total number of jobs, K KT, uh, the minimum number of servers that need to be activated should be this. So that's the user's kind of preferences or pre user's requirements you can think of. So now, if uh, the number of servers activated kind of falls in between, then both guys are happy, right? So your number of active servers is uh, greater than the minimum number of servers that users want to be activated. So users are happy. And also the number of activated servers is less than the maximum number of servers that the you know, servers would like to see, right? Then the servers are also happy. So this is a good, you know, the, no problem. So, so, so basically you can choose any, you know, uh, if this is the situation, then you can choose a cutoff value, you know, between this and, and both, both parties are happy. So like an example here, you've got 100 jobs and uh, each server wants at least uh, 10 jobs. They don't want more than 10 servers to be active. So CMAX is 10 and each user does not want more than 20 jobs per server. So they want more than five servers. So you see CMIN is less than CMAX. So, so in this case, the system will operate efficiently when both users and servers are happy, right? If your C lies in between uh, between five and 10, right? But what if, uh, yeah, so, you know, you can choose uh, if C mean less than C means you can choose your cutoff value, uh, either of them, I mean, and, 
and uh, so basically both the parties are happy but what if your c min is greater than c max so servers one not more than uh, uh, you know 10 servers to be active but users one uh, uh, more than 10 servers something like that then what do you do so here is an example again you have got 100 jobs and each server wants at least 10 jobs so there should not be more than 10 servers on. Otherwise, each server gets fewer than 10 jobs, right? They're not happy. And each, uh, I mean, user, uh, users don't want more than five jobs per server. That means they need at least 20 servers to be on. But servers don't want more than 10 servers. So you see, so then what do you do? Well, one way to resolve this uh, is uh, the servers can charge more money per job, right? So. Uh, well, to make the users happy, uh, you activate 20 servers, uh, but the servers should be paid more per job so that you know they get their minimum threshold revenue that they want, right? So, so basically, what I'm all trying to say in this model actually is possible to accommodate both of these situations depending on the user's requirement, right? Is is you can accommodate uh, both uh, these scenarios. So it's not, it's not a problem. You still can uh, obtain a threshold value here, right? Which makes both devices and the servers happy. So in this case, what you do, basically uh, the servers can ask for more money per job, you know? So, uh, so it's still, you know, it's still a minority game and you can uh, come up with the threshold. Okay, so uh, so now I think uh, game is kind of uh, clear. So the players are the servers here. You see, again, we are talking with the distributed solution. Each server makes a decision by itself, right? There is no controller. There is no like an SDN controller, uh, which is telling, okay, you go on, you go to sleep mode, right? So each server is making a decision in a distributed manner. And um, as I said, I mean, again, phi is something that the servers may not know, right? But uh, when you simulate the system, right, you need a phi uh, that determines the winning action and also the payoff of the players, right? But servers, they can guess, but uh, this is not something that is broadcast to the servers, right? So, uh, so each server has two actions, possible actions to uh, remain active or go into the sleep mode, right? And uh, again, attendance may be active, you denote by one and uh, like going to the bar and inactive, like uh, stay home, right? Uh, attendance is the number of active servers. So, so outcomes if a uh, number of active servers is uh, uh, less than five, right? Uh, uh, so, so basically the you know, the servers have a reward, right? But if the number of active servers is greater than five, then uh, then uh, then basically they are loser, right? They cannot earn their minimum kind of revenue that they want, right? So the um, remaining inactive is, is the winning, winning action here. But remember, we have... Uh, <clears throat> The phi is kind of chosen in a, in this system such that both uh, the uh, uh, servers and the and the devices are are, uh, are kind of happy, right? I mean, uh, right? So uh, uh, so it has been chosen to satisfy both the you I mean servers and the users requirement. Uh, okay, so the control information again is the outcome of the game at the the end of the each stage um and again the utility um, uh, um ekram you know yeah. just to interrupt i know the time check you know probably um you have another five ten minutes something yeah like i think i'll be done i'll be done oh, okay yeah, yeah I'm done. so actually yes similar thing so again we have this uh, utility defined like this for uh, uh for servers right if a server is active, it gets a positive utility if the number of active servers is less than this uh, threshold, right? And it gets uh, uh, a, a, 
server which is inactive, it gets a positive utility if uh, your number of uh, active servers is greater than the threshold, right? So this is how you calculate the utility for the servers when you simulate the system, same uh, distributed learning algorithm. Now, again, you know, so if you compare with random selection, uh, in this case, uh, this simple learning results in a better average utility per server. Um, so, and again, this is the uh, uh, optimal one. Uh, so, well, this is still uh, suboptimal, uh, but it's better than the kind of random selection. Now, actually uh, in the paper, original paper, we have more, uh, you know, kind of analysis. And now, I mean, you may, uh, you may ask, uh, how do we ch choose all these uh, uh, like, uh, KT, you know, like a K-mean, K-max, and these things, right? Uh, like if a user has a delay constraint, for example, right? Uh, that can be mapped into this K-max. So basically, uh, K-max is, you can think of like maximum number of uh, jobs that a server can have while meeting the latency requirement for each user, right? So uh so say each job execution just to give you an idea like you say if the processing time for a job follows a normal distribution for example so uh now if there are k jobs right so you can calculate the expected expected uh, you know processing time right and that you can relate it to uh, relate to this KMX. So what I'm trying to say, these values can be obtained from the uh, user requirements, latency requirements, uh, things like that. So, and for that, you can uh, assume some kind of distribution for the processing time at the servers. And then you can do some uh, probability calculations to kind of, you know, uh, say to satisfy certain latency constraint, probabilistic constraint, how many, uh, jobs you can have at most, you know, in, in the in the server. So just to give you an idea. Okay, so I think that's it. And um, so here we have basically described a very simple model, uh, only two option uh, minority game, but extension to multiple ex option may be also possible uh, because users may, you know, uh, uh, I mean, it's not only the computation, maybe the storage, right? So the servers can have uh, multiple uh, resources. Uh, and, and so basically uh, it will be a congestion game with multiple resources, right? It's not only one resource, but multiple resources. And we will be able to extend this basic minority game to this multi-option minority game. Uh, of course, the heterogeneity of the users, which you don't consider all users are we consider similar, but how can we extend the model to consider heterogeneity? Will be also interesting. A stochastic arrival of the users, which is uh, which should be done because in practice, in arrivals are not deterministic. So uh, your model calculations, those parameters need to be calculated by considering the stochastic arrival of the uh, jobs and also the service process in the servers, right? So, uh, you know, uh, different queuing disciplines may need to be, I mean, considered, so make them more kind of sophisticated, right? And also, as I was also mentioning, uh, the basic MG strategy is the one that we have described, do not evolve. So we choose a fixed number of strategies and try to just score them, right? And choose the one with the highest score. Maybe we should choose a different set of strategies, you know? Uh, over time, we should dynamically change this strategy set. So that's what we would call like evolutionary variation of, of minority game. And uh, so basically dynamically adjust the strategies over time. So that will give you a better learning uh, performance and different kinds of learning uh, methods can be used, exponential learning and other, like as I was saying, like uh, win, stay, lose, deviate, you know, the, the other, uh, other strategies might be, uh, might give, you know, better result depending on your problem and system model. So I think that's all. So thank you. Uh, very much and uh, i'm ready to answer questions if you have any um yeah thank you ikram um so there are a few questions uh, um in the uh, q and a oh, 
Oh, sure. Uh, oh, you yeah. want me to? Okay, so let me. Yeah. Or you can, you can, uh, Rath, you yeah. can. Uh, okay, so one question is, is, is there any active research in the minimize total energy consumption problem? There are. Uh, Rath, I can tell you, this is, this has now become an old problem. Last few years, you will see hundreds of papers written on this uh, task of floating. I mean, tens for sure. I mean, a lot of papers, hundreds. I should say probably, probably hundred, few hundred probably. You know, so a lot of papers have been written, and and uh, they consider uh, transmission energy, like you know, the access link, right? But I don't think many of them. Uh, Consider the whole whole process, you know, transmission, the processing, and then sending back and mul like multi-access edge computing, like multiple users, multiple servers. So a general model, I mean, seldom people consider. Maybe it makes the analysis very complicated, you know, because then a lot of things come to the picture: scheduling of the users, you know, scheduling the server resources, you know. So. Uh, the general problem is, is I think, is, is quite, uh, you know, complicated. People generally do like, you know, one user, one server, you know, or multiple user, one server. But in general, uh, the problem should consider multiple user, multiple servers, and service disciplines in the servers and things like that, you know, to have a, like a more kind of a complete. But of course, energy has been you know, also considered both at the user side and also in the server side yeah yeah i have seen many papers yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, in that area as well another yeah. question uh, let me read uh, do the servers uh, run some from uh, some form of virtualization to provide users with isolation to ensure their security and privacy if so uh, is this a second activation cost example a cold start time for containers yeah, very good question. In fact, uh, uh, of course, I mean, if you have a bunch of servers, I mean, you need to virtualize uh, the resources in the servers. Now, uh, virtualization itself have been done uh, quite, have been researched uh, quite extensively, I should say, in the, in the cloud computing context. You know, the similar concepts, I think, apply here, right? It's more like a resource partitioning and allocation. But I think that uh, what has not been done quite well is uh, integrating security there as well. So now, uh, in fact, recently, very recently, I should say, people are trying to also use uh, like blockchain kind of thing uh, in the context of Mac servers to make things more like a secure and so that even the uh, servers, they probably even don't know like whose job is kind of doing and things like that. So uh, bringing in security uh, along with virtualization, I think this is a new research topic. There is not, I don't think that much work has been done here, but virtualization itself is, has been done in the context of cloud computing quite a bit. Um, another question is like, you know, um, uh, it looks like, like, you know, you are, uh, um, work is uh, about, you know, um, maximizing the throughput and, and workloads and all. But what if, um, you know, the throughput needs to be above some threshold? So would the same approach uh, work for that uh, scenario? Uh, yeah, I think that now here we are considering latency, right? So, uh, uh, so you know, like an easy way to, uh, relate latency and, and throughput is, is like the inverse of latency is right. like throughput, you know? So it's a bit for the easiest, you know, way to... Or, or in other words, like, you know, that your latency needs to be um, um, uh, less than this much. Yeah, uh, so, instead so, of uh, everybody needs the lowest latency, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, so actually the way it is done in this paper, also I didn't show here, is like a probabilistic constraint. So the probability that your latency is say greater than some value is less than some epsilon. So, so basically here, the user's QoS was in terms of a probabilistic delay constraint, right? So that was done actually here. So now if you think of uh, throughput, I mean, I think that's not difficult, but as I said, 
inverse of latency is kind of, you know, people think that as kind of a throughput. Um, yeah, one, the other thing is, you know, in your work, like, you know, you showed uh, several strategies uh, and also you mentioned, you know, that can be improved and old. Um, but you did not talk uh, specifically about how to pick those strategies. Is there any, is there a uh, hidden rock paper uh, scissor <laughs> game uh, uh, in this problem? Yeah, that's a, that's a good question. Well, uh, I have to admit that they were done randomly actually. So we do not use any specific uh, strategy. Uh, yeah, uh, and actually uh, uh, there are some work already so you remember I said, when you go into the reduced strategy space, if you have history string is M, right? You actually choose two to the power M plus one yeah. strategies instead of two to the power, two to the power M because that's the universal space. So now the uh, results, what other people have shown, basically these uh, M actually, as long as your, uh, uh, M by N, like the total size of the strategy space and the number of strategies that you choose, that ratio is, is kind of important and you can have a kind of optimal ratio to uh, optimize your volatility. So other people have shown this. So, uh, I mean, the size of the strategy space would actually matter. Right. Even with this simple uh, algorithm, and this intuitive, right? I mean, you choose many, maybe you have a better chance to, uh, you know, to better, right? So, yeah. so the size matters. If instead of just choosing four strategy, maybe you choose eight, right? So, so you may have a better chance. So, but uh, how to choose this eight? Uh, I should say, I mean, it was done randomly here. Yeah. Okay. Right. One more last question. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, you know, you mentioned that you are in the future, you're going to look at heterogeneous use, uses, you know. So when you look at heterogeneous uses, I would expect that you're going to look at, you know, each of the users may have a different size, workload size and also a channel uh, condition, you know, channel condition changes or channel bandwidth changes, uh, you know, that will change the latency uh, for those users, um, you know, the uh, latency to transmit and receive as well. And also the QoS requirement for that user, you know, the, uh, every different users may have different uh, latency requirements on all. Um, so, if, you know, um, I hope you are going to look at those things, you know, when you look at those, uh, how do you, uh, you know, is that your approach would, would uh, work or, you know, is there any different so kind see, of approach? Uh, no, I, I have to admit that this basic model won't work, you know, this is too simple, you know, so, so, uh, so, uh, I mean, one approach that we are trying to use is more like a uh, reinforcement learning, you know, this multi-arm bandit kind of models, contextual bandits, you know, so there are different like a, Bandit model, they're actually reinforcement learning model, you know. So uh, they are not uh, game in that sense because they are like a single agent kind of decision models, right? So uh, so those can actually uh, accommodate, uh, you know, other aspects, heterogeneity, etc. Uh, and also there are like a multi-agent, uh, multi-arm bandit models. Mm -hmm. Uh, so we are looking into different models, not minority models, no, no minority games. So, and also, uh, I mean, uh, more from a centralized point of view, we are also looking at some auction models. So for this multi-user, multi-server MEC system, you know, so, so uh, no minority game, no, because this, Kind of there are limitations. This model is kind of a too simplistic. It's not easy to uh, incorporate a lot of different things. No. All right. Okay. I think we are uh, right on time. Um, so again, uh, thank you very much, uh, Ekram Hussain, for your um, uh, willingness to you know g uh, give a talk uh, for the Comsoc you know Oregon chapter. Uh, thank you so much, um, uh, Pradeep. Do you want to say anything? Yeah, thank you, thank you, Rath. Yeah, it has been a pleasure. Yeah. Yeah, I can hear you. <laughs> can you hear me? Yeah. I was talking and talking. Uh, yes, I, and I echo Rath by thanking everybody for joining the call today. And um, 
I hope you find it, uh, the content useful. And uh, we, uh, until next time, have a very good evening. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Thank you, everyone. Yeah. Have a good. Have a good yeah, thank you. <laughs>